This podcast is brought to you by Craft Spirits and Distilling for those who make and drink great spirits. Join our free email newsletter for technical and creative distilling stories in your inbox every week. Learn more at spiritsanddistilling.com. Welcome to the Craft Spirits and Distilling Podcast, episode number one. My name is Sydney Jones. I'm going to be one of your hosts. I'm joined by Molly Troop. I am the other host. And we're super excited to talk to you guys about all things distilling from a professional distilling perspective. Uh, We're going to have a lot of fun on this podcast. We're going to get into a lot of really nitty gritty, nerdy things. And we're really pumped about it. But before we get into all of uh, this fun conversation, let's talk about Technoblend. Craft the perfect blend every time by enhancing the flavor profile of your spirits with Technoblend's state-of-the-art blending and batching technology. Technoblend is the trusted partner of distilleries across the country, providing solutions for unparalleled accuracy and consistency in the distilled spirits production process. Visit Technoblend.com today to discover how their innovative solutions can redefine the art of distillation. Technoblend, blend the best. Is your distillery, brewery, or heck, should we say, brewstillery looking for better control of production, finance, compliance, inventory, supply drain, or more? You want a system that untaps your potential and future-proofs your strategy. You need total visibility into every aspect of your business, and you need it on demand. Visit craftederp.com to learn how Crafted meets you where you're at today and prepares you for everything that's coming tomorrow. Craftederp.com. A little bit of background for you guys. We are currently recording at the American Craft Spirits Association Conference in Denver. Having a great time. Seeing a lot of friends of ours in the craft distilling industry. A lot of really good information being put out there. And it's reminding me of several years ago... I was a baby distiller. Currently, I run Few Spirits in Evanston, Illinois. I've been distilling for about eight years. Uh, but before that, I was distilling in Florida, and I had gone to my first ever conference, and it was the American Distilling Institute Conference, and it was in Portland. And there was this really incredible speaker who was presenting on rotary evaporator distillation, And her name was Molly, and she's sitting across from me right now. (laughs) But I kind of developed this very intense professional crush (laughs) on Molly (laughs) and admired her so much. Uh, And rotary evaporation is really interesting. And it's people are getting more familiar with what it is. But Molly, could you give us a rundown of like what do you do with your rotovap? That's what we call it. Sure. Yeah. Um, So the rotary evaporator or rotovap um, shorthand is a tool that's really not seen often in our distilling community. It's very more common to see it in pharmaceutical use. Um, My first time using it was in a biochemistry undergrad lab. And I was doing something very different than what I do now, which is a bovine heart extraction, looking at enzymatic content in hearts. And it was a very fun lab, but very different. And normally how you use this is you are doing a distillation and what you're interested in capturing is what's uh, left behind in your um, distillation flask. Uh, But of course, for distilling, we're interested on the other side. So what's in the collection flask? And it's a really different way of using it, but it's the same technology. And it is just distillation, but with some conditions that have been tweaked. Uh, The thing that makes a roadmap special is that it's not on... It's not operating under atmospheric conditions. It's actually under a vacuum. And that changes the relationship between pressure and boiling point. And then boiling point can happen at a lot lower temperature. So instead of boiling at 78 degrees Celsius, which is boiling point for alcohol, you can boil um, as low as room temperature, which is around 30 degrees Celsius. There's different distilleries who use this and boil even lower. I think at Oxley at Bacardi. Um, boils their alcohol at negative five degrees Celsius. So there's a range in which you can do it all is depending on the vacuum that you have access to. And I don't have enough money to have a strong enough vacuum like Oxley, (laughs) but our vacuum does just fine. And the thing with flavor, because this is all about flavor, right? Trying to make the best flavor you can with a product is it just introduces a new element, a new layer to add. And so when we were first uh, making our first product, that was something we really wanted to introduce was an, a layer that was hard to achieve other, with other methods. We wanted to do something fresh, garden forward, 
and we wanted to use cucumber, rosemary, mint, and thyme that were grown very near our distillery. Um, but using fresh ingredients like cucumber in a heated still, it's going to taste very different. Uh, I don't know if anyone... I always say this. Uh, I don't know if you've had cook, cooked cucumber. Um, I did, sort of. Molly and I, we teach at a beverage laboratory. Uh, we teach gin distillation. And I know we, like, direct fire distilled some cucumber. That's right. And that was stewy as hell. Yeah. Not my favorite flavor. It's like... It reminds me of tails, like when you're doing a whiskey run. It's very cardboard forward and it's flabby and it's not good. It's not what you want your cucumber to taste like. For sure. And you can use extracts. That's not uncommon to do, but we wanted to use local agriculture. Yeah. And to capture those ingredients required using cold distillation Mm -hmm. or a vacuum still. So we've been able to apply that in other products now and use them for other fresh ingredients. And that's kind of my favorite way to use it where you're just maybe introducing a layer of flavor that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Yeah, Molly talked a little bit about tails there. So that's something that we'll visit in later on podcasts. But when you're distilling a product, and this is most traditionally done with whiskey, you have usable components of alcohol that you want, and then you have some byproducts. Uh, And we call those uh, different parts of the alcohol as they run off the still, heads, hearts, and tails. Hearts being the good stuff, that's what you want. Heads and tails are the extraneous things that you don't necessarily need, um, but will come off regardless. So that's a little bit of context there. I cannot get past the fact that you were distilling cow hearts (laughs) in a rotary. That sounds the most metal thing I've ever heard of. Maybe one day we'll release a cow heart product, but... Like Veganism a is very big in Portland. Yeah, like a pachuga <laughs> style yeah. gin. It was a very fun way to witness it. And I, I was really lucky in undergrad that we got to use a lot of equipment that you don't always get to use. And as I was working on my career and I was at a different distiller at the time, I we were talking about doing like a fresh flower. And flowers are really hard to distill unless you have... Like vapor, vapor pass is a technique you can use, which is where you're not doing a maceration where botanicals are in contact with the alcohol, but instead you're basically letting that vapor as it boils pass through your ingredients. Mm -hmm. And that can be a way to capture florals, but we didn't really have that setup available. And I wanted to see if there was other ways you could go about it. For sure. It didn't end up happening, that project, but it was really fun to play around. It reminded me of this really cool instrument that I ended up being able to buy and that's the distiller dream always i i see this really cool piece of equipment and i can actually buy it mine (laughs) (laughs) and so you make some of my most favorite gin in the entire world out at freeland um woman owned woman operated operation um you're very much the face of it along with jill who founded it um and you guys have always done really incredible things out there you're getting more into whiskey production which is outstanding. Uh, But Jen is like where I really fell in love with you. And I think it's so interesting how there are so many different routes that you can take with making a gin and you went the rotovap route. And when I first heard about that from you, my mind was just blown. Uh, what are like some of the weirder things that you've put into the <laughs> rotovap other than bovine hearts, which right. is amazing? Uh, the, the beginnings of my distillation obsession. Um, so when I first pitched this to Jill, because we, you know, we were buying other equipment, we had all this different stuff, resources dedicated to this. And so I had the job of being like, hey, Jill, I really think that this is going to help us get to the direction we want. Um, can I have it? And she was like, can I have it? I see it. I see what you're saying. And let me let me purchase it. And I think it arrived a week later and I put it together myself. And I knew like right away, cucumber, rosemary, ma- rosemary, mint and thyme that I wanted. So those were the first things I ever ran. And like after those were done, it, the recipe came together super quick. But I also was like, you know, we it's it's science, right? Sometimes you get so concerned with like certain ingredients, get obsessed with them. And like, I think this is going to work for what I want to do that you are not really having the full picture. Mm -hmm. So I always try to do a little bit of due diligence and explore weirder things. Like maybe this would work, you don't know. Maybe it's gonna be great. And so I did balsamic vinegar, was probably the weirdest thing I've ran. Mm -hmm. Um, And it tastes just like how you think, like like vinegar, like like bad ferment. And I was like, I I don't think that's how 
We're, I don't think that makes sense. All but of it's the terrible things than vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. I was on a really big shrub kick. So I was like, maybe I'm making like a clarified. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe different application in the bar. And that's where you can see, especially in Europe, some rotavaps being used is behind the bar. We don't get to use that in the United States because that's still technically distilling and it's not allowed. Um, but there are some really creative things you can do. Um, every once in a while you hear about like oysters or some like oyster foam being made, weird things like that. A rotavap can be a very helpful tool for that. Yeah, because I'm remembering last ACSA, you made that RTD that had... <laughs> Uh, Rotovap oyster a crab and a crab. <laughs> and there was a shell in there somewhere. Yeah, there was a shell, uh, and that, that's actually a, probably a, the that was the first animal I've done in my professional career. Other than um, bovine, hearts. other than bovine hearts, uh, that was really fun doing. We did an invasive green crab species. Um, I went to Newport and actually went crabbing with Jake, um, who was formerly at Rogue, and we. We got these crabs, put them in alcohol, and no, wait, I think I cooked them. I think I gave them a merciful death. That's good. And then I put them in alcohol. Death by rotovap. Yeah. And it, it was very interesting. It was very sea forward, as one can imagine. It was, had a beautiful hint of crab. Um, and it went into this wonderful random RTD that we did in honor of the American Craft Spirits Association's 10 year anniversary. It was a delight. It was so good. I stockpiled them in my hotel room like a little squirrel and I drank them um, when I got done at the end of the day. <laughs> well, you're in luck. We still have some. Hey. They have been in our boiler room, so they might be a little different, but... Warm crab. You can help me on the quality control. Like, how long is this really going to last at 10.3%? 10.3 or 10.8 percent. Yeah, hazing new employees. Yeah. Try this. Tell yeah. me what you think. <laughs> no, that's a joke. We don't haze employees. We, we don't. We, love it. we, we don't. Love employees. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of other weird ingredients, every once in a while we get something fun that someone brings by, mm -hmm. and we did this project with the Japanese um, Portland Japanese Gardens uh, using cherry blossoms, and cherry blossoms are really delicate, really fun to run. Um, and we got to go to the Japanese gardens, they gardens, they picked up, uh, they, they let the cherry blossoms fall onto tarps. And then we took those cherry blossoms and put them on alcohol and distilled them. And at the end of it, we were like, Oh, this is cool. Like, thank you guys so much. You've been so helpful. They're like, Hey, do you want these camellia flowers? And I was like, well, are they food safe? Well, like what's going on? Like, tell me more. They're like, Oh yeah, they're food safe. We usually give them to the lemurs at the zoo. Um, it's a lemur snack and I had to look into it a little bit more just to make sure that it was also for human consumption, not just lemurs, but we got to run just a little sample of that. And it was a lot of, it was very beautiful, very floral, very delicate, but that's so interesting because I always wonder myself now, and you and I have talked about this, uh, we as distillers, whenever we want to use a weird ingredient in a product and you've distilled all sorts of weird things, you have to go through the TTB, the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. And they are big brother. They set all of our rules and regulations for us. They tax us, but they also have this cute little list called generally recognized as safe mm -hmm. or grass. Um, so navigating grass can be a real headache, but you've gotten very good at it, especially with the forest gin that you did, I know. Yeah, the for our forest gin was our really first venture into a lot of ingredients that were on the grass list. So I I was really thankful that we had a team in place that kind of help us with that navigation. And a lot of it is just working on your communication and who who do you actually contact. And the grass list is posted by the TTB, but it's also monitored by the FDA. Mm -hmm. So you have to get the FDA to buy in on your ingredient, and there has to be some reasonable explanation of why this is safe to use so oftentimes that means like can you find it in a grocery store if the answer is yes it could be potentially something you use as long as it's in a food safe product in a grocery store and so we had this really kind of interesting back and forth with a few ingredients some that you're like this would make sense to be approved one of those was fiddleheads they did not like fiddleheads and we didn't we kind of we got a, a no on that and we didn't pursue it further it turns out I didn't also like the flavor on Fiddlehead, so I wasn't worth fighting for. And then we had a few other ingredients that, you know, didn't, were a little surprising. I could see them going either way. One of those, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it. 
Lichen. 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 I liken you a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lichen was not approved. I love the flavor of it. It can be hard on your liver, but then again, so is alcohol. Yeah. Um, And so I kind of let that go. I could see the reason behind it. But then six months later, I saw a lichen beer out in market. So frustrating. And I didn't. I'm, I'm. what do you do? Yeah, exactly. It, it, we have this love-hate relationship with the TTB and what they approve, what they don't approve. It's like the grain of paradise controversy. Right. Um, and certain gen- grains of paradise is a very common gin botanical, but certain states have flagged it as potentially causing birth defects. Mm-hmm. You know what else potentially causes birth defects? Drinking. Well, while pregnant. It's weird. It is weird. Yeah. It's like we're... Where are we going to stop this buck, guys? And Sydney, I'm going to ask you a question, too, because I find this fascinating mm-hmm. about Grains of Paradise. But since you're from Florida, right, <laughs> there's a very unique relationship Florida has with Grains of Paradise. Can you explain that? Uh, we don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> we hate it. We hate it. We, <laughs> we uh, say that you cannot use it, um, to my knowledge. I haven't tried to make a product with grains of paradise, at least when I was in Florida distilling, I was not using grains of paradise in any of the products that I was working with. And that was like a very purposeful choice because mm. it is a headache to use it down there. But the state of Florida is flat out like, nope, bad birth defects, malformed children. We can't have it. Right. They were even giving flack to Bombay Sapphire about their use of. They were. They were. And I believe they went to court over it mm-hmm. as well. And, you know, Bombay is still being sold in Florida. And I can't think of off the top of my head how that ended up resolving. But it was really interesting that, of all things, the state of Florida flagged Grains of Paradise and <laughs> brought that up. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought it was birth defects, but I also thought it was because it's their state flower. Oh. I'm, I don't know. The I don't know where I read that. Birth of Paradise, yeah, yeah, is a big flower down in Florida. Um, so maybe. Maybe. We might explore that. Yeah, stay tuned. Uh, yeah, <laughs> later on, we're going to plan on interviewing a lot of really cool distillers. And I'm hope I'm hoping we'll interview more gin distillers like yourself mm-hmm. and going down these paths of like weird botanicals and their weird histories and their weird relationship mm-hmm. with uh, the government and other distillers. And it should be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, and that, you know, I think it's a natural kind of segue to you and your favorite weird ingredient that you've gotten to play with for for gin or for whiskey. Yeah. Um, I come from a gin background. I was making quite a bit of gin when I was distilling in Florida. To back up a little bit, I got into distilling because I fell in love with bourbon and I moved to Kentucky and I showed up at a distillery and asked for a job and they gave me one (laughs) as a tour guide. And eight years later, here we are. Uh, But the big bulk of my distilling career was in Florida and I was doing gin down there. Uh, and I was experimenting with a lot of really cool things for a particular gin that I was working with. And I've been with few spirits now for about three years. Um, and we really love to bend the rules of what can go into whiskey and what cannot go into whiskey. So I've been working on some projects that almost have like kind of a Geneva background to them like it is definitely a whiskey but it has some botanical influence as well but I want it to be in a way that feels very natural so I've been playing around with smoked peppercorn I've been playing around with yopon tea um, and I love yopon tea yopon tea is grown natively in Florida uh, it's incredibly uh healthy for you from what I've read from the purveyors of it. And I I actually went down and visited them in New Smyrna Beach. And um, Yopan is a very sustainable uh, tea um, because it grows naturally down there and there aren't any big environmental effects of growing Yopan and harvesting Yopan. Uh, And I love the flavor that you get from it. So I've been playing with that as well. Uh, We at Few Spirits, we have a couple of products that we proof down coming out of cask with an alternative liquid. And it's a really fun way of introducing some flavor into whiskey that is not traditional. So usually when we are filling barrels of whiskey, we pump out a ton of rye, a ton of bourbon, 
um, we go into the barrel at 117.5 proof. And barrel entry proof is an interesting conversation. The legal limit for bourbon and rye whiskey is you cannot go into a new charred oak container at any higher than 125 proof. Uh, the higher proof that you go in at, the more alcohol solubles you're going to get out of that barrel, um, like tannin. Uh, you will also save yourself a little bit of money because you need less barrels uh, if you're filling in at a higher entry proof. Uh, that being said, lower entry proofs dissolve more uh, water-soluble molecules like sugar. So you can get potentially a sweeter product, but you also have to use a lot more barrels. So you kind of have to find this balance for what you want your barrel entry proof to be and how that best works with your product, what you're making, what you're shooting for with your new make spirit. And we make a whiskey off the still that um, is a little fatty. Uh, it rounds out at about 140 proof, which is well below the legal limit of 160 proof. Um, and it's got like a pretty high congener concentration and we love that. Um, so we go into the barrel at 117.5. That's what we shoot for. And when we harvest for six years down the road, uh, this proof is typically between like 120 to 125, somewhere in there. As you're aging whiskey, your proof more likely than not, will go up slightly over time. Now, this is also very dependent on heat and humidity and time and cask. Um, there are some climates where your proof will actually go down over time, but that's a whole nother conversation right there as well, which we I'm sure we'll get into later on in the podcast. But for us, we round out at like 120 to 125 as our cask strength whiskey. So run-of-the-mill whiskey production, you dilute that down with water to get to your bottling proof. Uh, but we thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if we used something that did not have a sugar content? Uh, because sugar, A, it's going to interact with how you're tasting this whiskey. It's going to influence your taste buds. The human body is naturally geared to crave sugar. And uh, B, when you're proofing, um, sugar creates obscuration uh, with your proofing uh, equipment. So you have to have special proofing equipment and it's very expensive. So we thought, well, like coffee, just plain black coffee that doesn't have sugar in it. And that has flavor. What if we use that to proof down whiskey? And then, um, the cold cut bourbon whiskey was born and it legally speaking is a distilled spirit specialty product. It's not a flavored whiskey. Uh, the cold brew edition is very minor, so I really view it as it's highlighting these really cool flavors and the whiskey itself because coffee is like a very commonly reported flavor in bourbon, um, these kind of desserty flavors that you get with cold brew. Uh, so we did that, and then we did a rye whiskey that we proofed down with cold extracted oolong tea, and that Ooh. is also so good like one of my most favorite products that we make. So this is a long convoluted backstory to saying that um, I love Yopon tea and I had been working with Yopon tea for a few years and drinking it in Florida. And I thought this could potentially be cool to use to proof down whiskey for um, a client that I'm working with. And we uh, started proofing down um, with Yopon, uh, this bourbon, and it was a fire roasted Yopon. So it was bringing some like really cool smoky flavors. And it gave it this like very interesting smoked herbaceousness that really like kind of grounded the sweetness of that bourbon and tempered the spice a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a really fun way of manipulating flavors in whiskey because ultimately at the end of the day, we as distillers were manipulating flavors for our benefit, for our benefit, for your benefit. Um, and it's something that makes this job kind of endlessly fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. What I really appreciate. Follow up question on that. You talked a little bit about barrel entry proof and a little bit lower and proof brings out a lot more sugar content, sugar quality. Mm -hmm. um, is that kind of crucial when you're working with something like cold brew or a tea which can be astringent to kind of help to balance astringency or was that not an issue so we found that we had a ton of astring astringency in coffee and tea if we were using hot products like mm -hmm. if we were brewing the tea or the coffee with heat it was creating these tannin byproducts that were not integrating well with the whiskey so we found this kind of cold extraction method so cold brew 
cold brew tastes significantly different than hot coffee. It's smoother. It's more velvety. Um, it's It has this sweetness to it without added sugar, which is really interesting. And same with the cold extracted oolong tea. It's much more subtle. It's less tannic. And it just integrated better into that product. So in terms of like barrel entry proof... Um, I think it complemented where we were at with our entry proof. It'd be interesting down the road. We have so much stuff in our warehouse right now. I think we have around like six to 7,000 barrels aging. There's a lot of them. It's very overwhelming when you walk through (laughs) our racks sometimes. Uh, But we have a lot of experiments that are going. Um, And other distillers, I know you throw spaghetti at the wall and you see what sticks in terms of finishing and barrel entry proof and you know few has been around for almost 13 years now i'm not the first distiller i definitely won't be the last for them but it's been cool to see all of these different experiments and harvesting them and um, seeing what they taste like and those ideas inspire new ones so maybe down the road i'll find something in our rick house that has a much lower entry proof and Mm -hmm. it'd be cool to see how that worked with the tea or the coffee edition totally yeah do you find that, because you've been a kind of more of a startup distillery that was only maybe a few years in at Manifest mm-hmm. to working at Few has a little bit more established. Is there like a difference in what you get to play with ingredient wise? Like uh, it feels like with Few Spirits, you probably get a lot more mature inventory that yeah. you get to, you know, see how it, how it's done. Yeah. Look at your, your stuff that you're newly producing, see how it compares and have a lot of data points where when you're kind of new, like you said, you're throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks. And it's kind of a different strategy at that point. For sure. And, you know, you've started a distillery from the ground up as well. So you you kind of understand this, that when you're working for a startup and you're developing um, products for them, and that's I did some of that for Manifest. There were two products in particular that they have in their portfolio that I, I developed for them. Um you don't have a lot of data to rely on. And Florida in particular has such an intense climate that makes it very tricky to produce whiskey. And when I was down there, we were making quite a bit of rye whiskey. So we were doing a few different experiments with barrel entry proof, barrel sizes, things of that nature to see what would really work in these kind of extreme conditions. Uh, The heat was very excessive. The humidity was very excessive. And this was causing barrels to mature at a very quick rate. So we had to be very cognizant of how we were distilling, where we were making our heads, hearts, and tails cuts. And in terms of distillate, we like to talk about like lean versus fatty cuts. If you're allowing more of these like fatty esters um, and amino acids through your distillate, we say that's a fat or fatty distillate. Uh, and those can age really beautifully, but they need more time mm-hmm. because uh, all of these like complex molecules need time to degrade in cask. And that takes a very long amount of time to do that. Uh, in Florida, we did not have the luxury of that time because our evaporative loss was just so brutal. We were losing like 10% a year, which was insane. Uh every year, and especially for the size of our operation, um, it made producing whiskey very expensive. So we had to really think about making a leaner cut that would age better in a shorter amount of time for the distillate that we were putting into that barrel. And then it was a waiting game. We Mm -hmm. had to see what worked and what didn't two or three years down the road. The really fun thing about Few is that because we have been operating for so long, I have this incredible library that I can go and reference. And, you know, when I was interviewing with my boss, Paul uh, Hletko, uh, originally when he brought me on the team, um, I was kind of like spitballing ideas that I wanted to play with maybe at some point down the road. And he's like, oh, we've done that. Oh, we've done that. Oh, we've done that. I'm like, okay, well. What haven't you done, Paul? (laughs) Thank you for snipping my wings a little bit. Just kidding. He's so supportive and so great. But it's really great because once you can taste how these things have matured um, and you come into this plethora of like really amazing quality aged whiskey, you can get creative and kind of piggyback off of that. And that's kind of what myself and my team have been doing. Um, We've worked with really cool finishing barrels and we know it works now and we know it doesn't work. We have worked with this infusion of uh, spices and we know what works and what doesn't. Uh, And it's a cool, it's a very different place than where I was before. Um, 
and both have been very valuable experiences. Uh, but it's been very helpful for me in terms of rethinking how you make whiskey is just having a very big lab to play mm-hmm. with, you know? Yeah. So speaking of whiskey production, you are making some really incredible whiskey now that I've had the chance to try and I'm so blown away by it and I want to hear more about it. But before we get into that, uh, let's talk about Country Malt Group. Uh, They're proud to support craft distillers across North America with a carefully curated portfolio of the best everyday ingredients and supplies, including malt, adjuncts, fruit, yeast, and more. Visit countrymalt.com slash distilling to view their complete list of distilling products, resources, and podcast episodes. And say goodbye to the complexities of ordering equipment and supplies from multiple vendors and say hello to the efficiency and simplicity offered by Lotus Beverage Alliance. This new alliance brings together craft beverage industry powerhouses, G.W. Kent, Alpha Brewing Operations, Stout Tanks and Kettles, Twin Monkeys Beverage Solutions, Brewmation, and Automated Extracts to provide an unrivaled portfolio of craft beverage equipment and supplies. Experience the convenience of working with one vendor, one source for all your craft business needs. Visit LotusBevAlliance.com now and start streamlining your process today. So tell me about... Your rye whiskey. Oh, our rye whiskey. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, talking, we spoke a little bit about um, starting a distillery. Mm-hmm. And so I am was the second person to be involved with Freeland. And it gave me a lot of ability to control a program and to really release things I was passionate about. And when Jill and I first met, we had a common love of both gin and rye whiskey. So that was always on our docket to make a rye. But of course, when you're making something from scratch, it takes a while. And we, uh, while we launched our first product in 2017, we were privileged to be able to do that gin uh, using a neighboring distillery's equipment, while our distillery is actually still being built out. Which everyone in this industry knows, it can take a lot longer than you think. (laughs) Uh, we, I think we were hoping for a spring 2018 launch and it was fall 2018, which isn't that bad. Yeah. And so fall 2018 came and we were able to do basically our rye whiskey production. Um, leading up to that, we were doing a lot of flavors, working with grain farmers that we were passionate about working with. Cause that is our big thing that we wanted to do and wanted to achieve is using local agriculture. And that kind of puts a limit on the ingredients you can use in a way, but it also means that you're being really tactical with those ingredients. So we ended up partnering with Camas Country Mills. They are about two hours south of us in Eugene, Oregon, and they produce a lot of different grains. Um, They either grow it themselves uh, or they work with other local farmers. And uh, we fell in love with Tom, who's the owner there. He's a retired school teacher and it really shows. I think he, and I I can't imagine retiring from such a hard career and then starting a farm, which is equally hard. (laughs) How much stress you want in your (laughs) life. (laughs) And he handles it beautifully. I'm sure. Um, But he, he, as a farmer, and he happened to also want to do milling. So um, it's stone melt there. Mm -hmm. Um, And he really, really was working on a few of the ingredients he was trying to sell us on. But there was one ingredient that in particular with rye I wanted to use, which was buckwheat. And buckwheat is this really interesting flavor because it is, it's a really interesting grain to work with because it is a lot like rye and that it is problematic. Yeah. I've never worked with buckwheat. I've made a ton of rye whiskey in my career, but I've heard that buckwheat is also kind of a problem child in terms of how viscous it gets and mm-hmm. foaming and all that good stuff. And, you know, the reason rye whiskey is so good is because it's full of distiller tears mm-hmm. and buckwheat is the same. And I had had the privilege of working on 100% buckwheat whiskey before and seeing how that worked all by itself and the flavor that could achieve. Um, it didn't deter me from using it. I was like, I can figure out how to massage this because we've figured out how to make rye work for us too. And a lot of that is just kind of your enzyme protocol that you're using. Mm-hmm. So wanted to work with that and then a barley to kind of round out the flavor profile. And that's the kind of the challenge when you're starting a program too, is you're very much leaning into what you're hoping to achieve. And there's certain ways you can kind of, you know, lead that program where if you, we were very set in our grain bill and there's some other variables with whiskey that you can control. A lot of that came down to mashing, fermentation, distillation, and, um, Barrel aging, mo- a lot of what we were talking about earlier with what what proof to put down the whiskey. Mm-hmm. Um, and we came out with this really interesting 
kind of technique with starting at a little bit lower proof and then also having some variance. So as time would come and thing would, things would mature, we'd be able to blend and potentially blend with something that's a little higher yield or higher alcohol content, something that's a little bit lower and potentially get busted both worlds mm-hmm. or find some really nice honey barrels, mm-hmm. which is a yeah, exclusive barrel that you don't want, don't want to blend with anything else. It just needs to be highlighted all on its own. It's the shining star. The shining star. Yeah. Always fun when we get to see those. Mm-hmm. And we started putting barrels down January 2019. And the goal with this was always to be bottled and bond. And when you're starting whiskey, that's a really tall task. Um, I remember tasting it with uh, Jill, the founder, at two years old. And she was like, this is amazing already. And I'm like, I want to wait <laughs> just a little longer. And by a little bit, let's double the time. Yeah. Um, and she got what she got what the messaging was and was totally on board. And so the first time those barrels matured was last year. Um, we were we had our stock that started becoming mature at 20, 23 January. And all last year was kind of waiting for not just one barrel, mm-hmm. but the rest of the barrels become mature and then kind of going through, tasting them all individually and putting it together. Yeah. And we had a lot, I had a lot of fun doing that. And we kind of got to this place with this whiskey where we're like, we're selling it at a, at a pretty premium price point and it's very tactful because we are only in small markets with it and that's what we want to be. And that's also allowing us to sit on our inventory even longer mm-hmm. and to continue to age it. So like we will have some barrels that are five years already and we'll probably end up having six year old um, be when the time comes. It, that will be 2025, but <laughs> we'll, we'll have some stock that's six years old plus. Yeah. And we're just working to get it continually more and more mature. And that's really hard when you're starting out. Yeah. It's really hard to just sit and wait. It really is. And that's why bottled and bond designations are so exciting for craft producers like ourselves. And for those of you guys that don't know, the Bottled and Bond Act, I believe of 1897, um, was the first consumer protection legislation ever introduced into law uh, by Colonel E.H. Taylor. Um, At the time, there were a lot of people making fake whiskey, uh, and it was... uh, really tarnishing the reputation of legitimate distillers. So Mr. Taylor proposed to Congress that there be the Bottled and Bond Act, which states that for a whiskey to be bottled and bond, it has to be at least four years old. It can be older, but it has to be at least four years old, has to be 100 proof, has to be distilled by one distiller at one distillery in one distilling season. Uh, and it has to be aged under the supervision of a treasury agent in a bonded warehouse, which mm-hmm. is kind of redundant now because all of our stuff that is aging has to be in a bonded warehouse. But yes. um, the age statement really there is kind of crucial for craft distillers that are just trying to get some age under their belts. Now, I had a question for you because I know what I look for, but when you are going and evaluating these barrels that you laid up and you're determining, you know, when they are ready to harvest, when they're ready to bottle, or when they need a little bit more time, what are you looking for in your whiskey's profile? A lot of the time, what I'm looking for is um, differences and commonalities. So you really are doing these in, I usually am looking at like 12 barrels at a time. And it's not in one day. It's pulling barrels, spending a few days looking at them, looking at them in different ways, right? We are trying to take out some of our bias with sampling, which, you know, you want to change the order. You want to change what you're sampling it against. So it's just looking to see what what do these barrels have in common? Mm-hmm. They should have a lot, but they may not always. That's the fun thing about whiskey. Mm-hmm. And what are, the others, what are the differences that we're finding too? And from there, that kind of helps to educate what comes next, right? You're looking to see if these do well in a blend, if you can take 12 barrels and put them together and it's going to be something delicious or if they're going to fight each other. Um, that can happen too. Sometimes there's flavors that just don't really work well together. Um, do I need to split a barrel in half and then it works fine? Do I need to take this honey barrel out, which you're, everyone always hopes to find and just have this single barrel release that is spectacular and everything else is har- harmonious. Harmonious. Um, harmonious. Thank you. 
I'm not great with words, um, as we that's will find home. out on long this podcast. <laughs> 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 and that's where it's kind of it's a little abstract when you're looking at something. You you're obviously doing all that scientific analysis, like you're looking at your flavor chart. You're seeing where this is falling in flavor wise, but it is a little bit of like counseling, right? You're you're seeing how these all work together is the family complete are they having arguments what are are those arguments can they be solved and then trying to figure out how to you know keep the peace make the peace make it a really delicious product yeah and tasting is so subjective and there are so many definitions out there of what people think is a matured product and what people think is an immature product and it frustrates me that people oftentimes will equate a poorly distilled product with something that's just young or Mm -hmm. immature because those are two vastly different things i've I've tasted poorly distilled whiskey and i've tasted whiskey that is just more grain forward than it is oak forward Mm -hmm. uh and they're not the same thing right and something i always try to like harp on is like we really need to talk about how we're discussing these whiskey flavors and what we're searching for in terms of desirable flavors and undesirable flavors. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the consumer perception of them uh, is very different and oftentimes is like so heavily influenced by so many outside things Mm -hmm. like the age debacle, the age debacle. And I, I love arguing with this because preferentially I lean towards grain forward. Mm -hmm. Like I, I do love when grain and barrel come together and they're, they're making a great team. Um, but I don't like something that's over oaked. No. So there's always, and when you look at like regionality for scotch, for me, a sweet spot for age is 18 or less. Yeah. Um, anything that's over that, I tend to find it's over oaked and I'm just not happy with it. And I was like, you can just stop aging at 18. That's fine. It's perfectly fine. And in bourbon, that's dependent on the region because Kentucky is a little bit sometimes more harsh on climate and they tend to produce some older stuff. Um, but like there's a certain sweet spot there too, in my opinion. And that's where it's fun because it is my opinion. Some people like something that's more oaked, but yeah. I hear that you also might not. <laughs> yeah, I just, I personally love the flavors that you can develop in fermentation with very purposeful yeast selection and with very purposeful grain selection. And something that we do at Few, we use alternative yeast strains. We don't use traditional distiller's yeast. We use a uh, wine yeast that has also been used in some rum production, but it's um, basically like a high gravity yeast strain uh, to make our our rye whiskey and then a beer yeast uh, to make our our bourbon. And we get some really unique flavors from this. And my fear is that if we aged it a kajillion years, uh, we would lose kind of these really interesting flavors that we get. Uh, something that I worked on recently that I'm so excited about and it came out so, so, so well is I made a 100% rye whiskey. And I love 100% rye. I made one down in Florida that tasted very, very cool. But I had this thought of using an alternative yeast strain to make 100% rye. And 100% rye, it's a little bit of a beast to work with. It, It foams. It gets sticky. It basically turns into concrete. So... The first kind of step in making a 100% rye is you really have to like hammer out um, your enzyme usage uh, and you have to dump a lot of that in there. You need a good dose of alpha amylase for your starch conversion and then you need a good dose of beta gluconase for pumpability and liquefaction. 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 Yeah, that word. Uh, So you need um, this kind of correct cocktail if you're making a 100% rye whiskey and it can be kind of hard to figure out what that might be and um, at what temperatures you cook this whiskey. But I got this figured out and the yeast strain that I decided to use was a phenol off note negative yeast strain. So rye whiskey as a whole uh, sometimes can be viewed as a very aggressive type of whiskey, very spicy, very spice forward. And the culprit for that, that we long associate, and disclaimer, it's very hard to attach olfactory sensations to chemicals because we all kind of taste things differently, but commonly agreed that spice notes come from a chemical called 4-vinyl glycol or 4-VG. 
And to control the amount of 4VG in a whiskey, like a rye whiskey, you need to control its precursors. And the precursor there is going to be furilic acid. And rye grain in particular has quite a bit of furilic acid bound in its cell wall, which creates these beautiful spice notes. If you're using a type of yeast strain that has a phenol off note positive characteristic. Uh, and most distillers yeast is puff positive. So naturally for years and years and years, we've just been creating spicy rye whiskey because we've been using puff positive yeast traditionally. So the yeast that we use for our rye whiskey at few is a puff negative yeast. And our rye whiskey is a uh, 70% rye, 20% corn, 10% malted barley. So I know what that tastes like, and I love it. It's a very non-traditional rye whiskey, but I wanted to see how this yeast would do with 100% rye. What if I took all this furilic acid and just threw it out the window? And the result was fascinating. This distillate, I kid you not, tastes like peach rings. Ooh. It tastes like candy, like fruity peachy candy. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited to see how that's going to age, I'm going to check it like a hawk like every year. So how old is it now? It is only a few months old. Okay. Yeah. So I'll probably check it at the one year mark. We got like nine or 10 barrels out of this, uh, this short trial run and they went into 53s. So they will take a little bit longer. But these beautiful fruit characteristics that I'm just so obsessed with in the mm -hmm. distillate, I would hate to lose that right. with a really long maturation that just over infuses oak into this product. So I think especially if you're using interesting yeast, um, if you're using interesting grain, if you're going to age it too long, you're going to lose all of what makes that whiskey right. special. And I think kind of fermentation is the unsung hero mm -hmm. in terms of what w makes whiskey taste the way that it does. And Four Roses, I mean, they, they're using all sorts of yeast strains to make theirs. And they've really kind of cornered that market in terms of the big producers using cool yeast strains. And you're seeing more and more of that enter the conversation. And I'm glad because, totally. yeah, this is, I mean, rum distillers, Mezcal distillers, tequila distillers, like they know that weird yeast, wild yeast and bacterial contamination can produce some really beautiful things. Right. Atmospheric factors. Exactly. Yeah. For sure. For sure. When um, I was pregnant with my first kid um, and I told Jill, um, she said, great. Um, I told her the name Isla and she said, great, let's make a single malt. <laughs> and so we got to spend like the six months leading up to taking maternity leave, thinking about what kind of single malt wanted to make and had a lot of room to play with yeast. So we ended up going and actually working with a little uh, brewery near us, Little Beast, who does an amazing Saison program and begged for some yeast of theirs. And uh, they gave us some, which is very, very nice of them. It's a very nice collaborative yeah. industry. Um, and so we were making our single malt using Saison least and it, was this really interesting banana clove flavor, kind of like you you get a bit in Saison, that just is going to barrel age very well. Mm -hmm. And of course, like we're not we're not going to get too old with this anyways. One of them does have to be twenty one years old by the time it's dumped. That was the agreement I made with Joe <laughs> for, <laughs> for little Isla, <laughs> little Isla. What kid doesn't want? Well, probably not a kid. What. 21, what, 21 year old, year old. <laughs> yeah <laughs> she'll be happy when it happens yeah maybe um, you don't tell her about it until she turns 21 yeah, she won't have the perspective yet no. um but i'm really excited because we that's we put 10 barrels down it's very limited and we'll probably do just the last barrel at 21 and we'll be able to see it through segments of time and really see you know it, it's hard to put put whiskey away for a long time but we'll be able to see how it matures and i really have a feeling that sweet spot's going to be right around seven years well and especially up there you guys are dealing with a cooler climate as well that is going to be a little bit more gentle on the whiskey while it matures and you can't afford to push it a mm -hmm. little further i mean that's why you know scotch the the country that's aged in scotland doesn't deal with 90 degree temperatures at least not right now have yeah. you seen the scottish try to deal with 90 degree temperatures <laughs> it's a lot of people without shirts on that are beet red just, <laughs> yeah just pasty turned yes. beet red but yeah they deal with a very cool very gentle climate that we don't necessarily always deal with here in the united mm -hmm. states so you can afford to kind of push your whiskey a little further out there without um, unbalancing your product. Exactly. Yeah. I think the sign of a well-made whiskey, young, old, 
I don't care. I think age statements are a good way to gain information about the product, but I do not think that they guarantee a quality product or not. And I argue till my face is red with people all the time about this and I will stick to my guns. Uh, I think a well-made whiskey is equal parts of the distiller's uh, decisions in terms of grain, in terms of yeast, in terms of distillation style. I mean, just how you're running it off of a still and the type of still that you're using, it's going to make a huge effect in flavor. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, warehousing manager's decisions. So where you're aging it, how you're aging it, what it's exposed to, what it's not exposed to. And then the blender's decision, how they're blending all of these products into a cohesive thing. It's this kind of perfect uh, three-part process that if all of these people are working in harmony, or if you are that one person and you're doing all of these jobs, you need to think of them as separate but equally important jobs. Uh, if everything comes together the way that it should, that is what is creating a good whiskey. But I think we put so much emphasis on aging. Mm -hmm. It drives me crazy. Do you think for, for and I think this evades me, is aging sexy? Is that what it is? I think so. I think because you have all these people, like I think in popular media, um, it seems sexy to be drinking like a 25 year old single malt whiskey from right. Scotland. And that's all well and good. I've had some really amazing older Scotch whiskey, but there's so many and so much more whiskey out there than Scotch and it won't age the same way and it won't taste the same way. And, yeah, I think a lot of it is popular media. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of wonder, too, like the imaging that our industry puts out, too. A lot of it is focused in barrel rooms because they kind of look, I, I'm, I'm not going to say sexy because I don't think that's what they look like. They look mysterious. Mm -hmm. They look intimidating. They look like passion laid away. Right. And you don't always get that same feeling when you look at inside a distillery and see a still. Sometimes they're really beautiful, sure, but it also looks very industrial. Very much so. And they should. They mm -hmm. are industrial spaces. Yeah. I would 100% agree. There's something very romantic about barrel aging and anyone who's been on like a Kentucky Bourbon Trail tour will tell you that there is like a very indelible image left in your brain walking through a Rick House in the summer and smelling the angel share and all that good stuff. And so, of course, we put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, standing over a bubbling vat of fermenting grain is not necessarily as sexy. As your tour guide says, don't lean too far over. Yeah, and lose your sunglasses in there. <laughs> right? You're not getting them back. No, <laughs> never. They belong to us now. Uh, but it is such a crucial part of flavor development. And um, it makes me sad when it's disregarded. Or uh, when it's overlooked or uh, when it's drowned out by uh, an excessive amount of aging. Or on the flip side of that note, when it's uh, highlighted in a very unfortunate way by underaging. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, there is such a thing as too little age on a whiskey. Right. You know, I It's get, all about balance. It is really about balance. Um, and just talking about age, you're doing su yourself such a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, there's some, there's such beautiful whiskey out there that's so much younger. And I, I have a question because I know we're talking a lot about fermentation and how important it is. And Few has this really cool, I'm going to call it hybrid fermentation yeah. that they've been doing that is very uncommon. I can't think of anyone else I know who's doing it. Yeah. Um, we started partially fermenting um, with koji spores. Um, shout out my operations manager, Riley Henderson, for coming up with that project. Uh, it's been very fun to work on and distill. Um, so koji is used in um, soju production um, over in uh, Asian countries. And it's a, a fungal spore. So for us, we are essentially using it partially as an alpha amylase, um, and it's converting, uh, well, really a glucoamylase. Um, it's doing long-term conversion of sugar for us uh, in the fermentation tank. And we are growing this koji spore on long grain rice, and then uh, we, we let it develop over a period of a couple of weeks, and then we add it into uh, a mash. We've done rye whiskey. We've done like a rye wheat blend and we let it ferment for about two weeks. It ferments at a very, very high level of acidity. Um, it produces all of this cool, really um, like citrus forward notes in it because of the citric acid that is happening. 
there and it tastes like grapefruit juice coming off the still. It's really cool. It's called Serial Killer. We've released like our first batch of it um, in Chicago. It sold out almost immediately because we only made like 49 cases of it. But it's something that we're going to continue to work on and we're using different types of koji, um, potentially uh, different mashes as well. But it's been a fun experimental thing and it's a, definitely like a source of secondary flavor. That's not coming from a barrel. It's coming mm-hmm. from fermentation. So something um to keep an eye on if you are in the chicago area and you like few spirits that that's a cool one i would like a bottle of the next release please yes <laughs> i can i can make that happen for you i personally think in the next few years we are going to start seeing more used casks enter into the craft distilling sphere and maybe even with your large producers uh and i think we're not going to pump out maybe as much bourbon and rye whiskey, maybe some American whiskey in there to help deal with the great American bar- barrel shortage. If you guys aren't aware, there is a barrel shortage right now. We're having a hard time getting our hands on barrels. Um, and it's been really interesting for craft producers in particular that don't have um, a direct line with your really big cooperage houses like Independent Stave Company. Uh, and you know, first use, second use, third use barrels, all of these things are going to age your spirit differently. I like thinking of a barrel as a tea bag. Every time you use a barrel, it's going to extract color, flavor, and the more times you use them, the less of that influence you're going to get. And then on the flip side of that coin, whatever was aging in that barrel, originally the devil's cut, a little bit of that is going to be trapped in the wood and that will influence that spirit, which is where we get this really crazy world of barrel finishes but has the great barrel shortage affected you at all totally um we were we've always been making a limited amount of rye but i think our we hit our even more of a limitation there with not being able to find as many barrels as we would like um we had worked with a a cooper for three years and you know we don't, we never were that big of an account, but when we reached out and be like, Hey, we'd like to place our order. Like there's a two year wait list. Yeah. Um, and so that changes how you're getting barrels. It's going to change where those barrels come from, which also has an impact in your flavor that we will navigate when we get there. Um, and you know, the nice thing is we're not the only ones who are going through this. There's going to be a lot of different distilleries, big and small that have changed where they source their barrels to if not their entire barrel portfolio, then at least some of them. Yeah, we've run into that as well. We have traditionally always been using a Minnesota cooperage called Barrel Mill. They're great. I've worked with them for a very long time. I absolutely adore them. I love the barrels themselves. I love the products that they create out of these barrels when you use them to age spirit. Uh, But um, there were some uh, issues getting barrels from them because of the great barrel shortage. So, Disclaimer, a um, few spirits. We are part of a portfolio called Samson and Surrey. And a couple of years ago, Samson and Surrey was acquired by Heaven Hill Brands. So we're part of the Heaven Hill family now. So when we got hit with the Great Barrel Shortage issues, we contacted them and they were able to get us a line on some independent stave company barrels. Um, we use the same specs, uh, toasted, uh, medium toast, toast underneath the char as well, and toasted heads, number three char. But it is going to be really different down the road. Um, You know, Minnesota oak versus Missouri oak. These are two very distinctive regions. They're both white oak, but they're going through different climates, different growing stressors. Uh, The wood grain is different. So this is a problem that I'm going to deal with six years down the road. I'm not dealing with it right now. We'll leave that for future Sydney. Yeah, future Sydney gets to worry about that. (laughs) Current Sydney does not worry about it. Uh, But And also just from a practical standpoint, so we palletize our barrels. You guys have to do racking. We've done both. uh, We've dabbled with both. Yeah, so we do palletized systems. And something that I discovered very early on when we got... ISC barrels in is that they were like slightly like by like a quarter of an inch taller than the barrel mill barrels. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't stack these together. So we have to be like very 
careful with how we're creating these palletized barrels so we don't create unstable stacks and have like a whiskey avalanche at some point. Um, so from like a warehouse perspective, it wasn't something I was anticipating having to deal with this because I'm one of the people that palletizes our barrels with a forklift and it's already a precarious operation. So when you throw in different sizes of barrels, it's, it's kind of tricky. There's an <laughs> other element to the high stakes Tetris that uh, is yeah, barrel stacking. It's like reverse Jenga. Yeah. And yeah. You just kind of um, pray. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You go very slow. Very slow. Very Have a spotter. Slow. Yeah. Well, you guys can't stack super high because of earthquake stuff in Portland. And I know that's right. such a headache for you in terms of warehousing. Oh, right. Because, I mean, we are we have 10,000 square feet and we have as much barrel storage on site as we can, but because we can only stack too high, unless if we wanted to go higher, we could, we'd have to sprinkler every level. Which and is I, insane. I still can't wrap my head around that. It's a big earthquake, fire safety, respect to firefighters everywhere. I get it. But it does definitely kind of put a cramp on how you're barrel aging for us that means that we're not going to get any barrels that are like you know high up and have maybe had a little bit more impact from pressure a little bit more sunshine shining on them yeah a little bit more heat a little bit more heat rises it does and so all of ours are pretty like even keel in terms of flavor and progression in that way i feel like you have a lot of uniformity just from that system but it it helps for that is very annoying i'm sure it is i look at the nice side of it it it, you know we have consistency in our life and that's great um but yes i would love to be able to stack five high it's like those people um in movies who are like they're trying to save a building and there's another building go up and they end up selling the air rights Mm -hmm. to that building like you the city of uh, Portland owns your air rights <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> um, and I have tried this argument before of like, you know, if there's the big one, which is what we call the ne- next earthquake, we're all like, convinced it's going to be the big one. Yeah. There's no hope anyways. So why? We're all going into the Pacific. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, the 2012 style. is going to be split in half along 84 and Portland will be no more. So like, is it going to matter? <laughs> they don't like that argument. No. I get it. I get why. When you bring up the apocalypse, people get kind of squirrely. Yeah. <laughs> <I> find, especially <laughs> firefighters who I think are going to have the short end of the stick when it comes to those times. Shout out to all firefighters. <laughs> Thank you for your service. <laughs> we try not to make your lives harder with how we stack yes. barrels. We try. <laughs> we try so hard. <laughs> oh, man. So on that downer note of Oregon sinking into the Pacific Ocean, 2012 style. We very much hope it does not do. Great movie. Great movie. We don't want it really happening. Great effects. Yes. Yeah. John Cusack, if you're listening, big fan. (laughs) I think he's listening. I would like to think so. But on that note, before we uh, head out, craft the perfect blend every time with TechnoBlend's state-of-the-art blending and batching technology. Gain total visibility into every aspect of your business with crafted ERP. Country Malt Group offers a carefully curated portfolio of the best ingredients and supplies. And Lotus Beverage Alliance offers one source for all of your craft beverage equipment and supplies. If you've enjoyed this podcast, go to spiritsanddistilling.com and sign up for our free newsletter featuring news stories every week from some of the best writers and distillers in the distilling world. Uh, And I can't wait to learn more about Freeland as we go through this process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can find more about Freeland on Instagram or Facebook or even LinkedIn these days. Yeah. What about with Few and for you? Few Spirits, we're all over the Instagrams. We're all over the Facebook. We also have a great newsletter that you can sign up for as well that you can find through social media. Um, I'm on social media as well. Sydney Jones uh, is where you can find me on Instagram if you like dog pictures and pictures of stills. That's what I post. Yeah, I'm I'm whiskey biscuit and yeah. likewise dogs, babies, and and stills. Yeah. Sometimes beverages. Awesome. Well, we'll be back in two weeks with another in-depth distilling conversation for you. And thank you so much for joining us for episode one. We had a whole lot of fun recording this on site at ACSA 2024. Yes, thank you, everyone.
This podcast has been brought to you by Craft Spirits and Distilling for those who love to make and drink great spirits. Join our free newsletter today at spiritsanddistilling.com for pragmatic, technical, and creative distilling stories in your inbox every week. Sign up now at spiritsanddistilling.com or click on the link in the show notes.